This is the three hour major CLE um, put on by the business committee. And our first hour is going to be a presentation by John Schemer with the CRC Insurance Group. He's a property and casualty broker and has been in that role for about seven years. He joined CRC Group in 2007 in an entry level position and has just worked his way up um, over the past 13 years. He's been in Orlando since the 80s, um, so a, a native, and he has a degree in film production. Uh, when he is not handling business insurance, underwriting, and, and his clients' needs, in his spare time, he enjoys golf, wine, and watching soccer. Uh, John's going to give a approximately one-hour presentation on policies and claims and uh, COVID-19-related things. So on that end, John, the floor is yours. Hey, Sam, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first, uh, oh, hold on, sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, basically what I do is uh, I go out, market, quote, bind issue for uh, CRC Group. We are an insurance intermediary excess and surplus lines wholesaler. So for those that don't know what that is, we are basically a middleman. Uh, we have seven Lloyd's contracts that we write property throughout the state of Florida. And we have approximately 2.6 billion in aggregate uh, currently deployed throughout the state. Uh, so Florida is predominantly, or I'm sorry, dominated by property insurance. And if your homeowner's rates have gone up uh, recently, then you, that's where we are. That's pretty much why. Uh, first thing I have uh, to share is a, uh, it's basically a brief market summary that we put out on a quarterly basis uh, from our company and First thing I wanted to kind of go through was the COVID-19 losses as it relates to the entire globe. Uh, as you can see right here, Swiss Re, which is one of the largest uh, reinsurance companies in the world, uh, is currently has reserves of 2.5 billion, and that's just for the first half of the year. Uh, Chubb, another gigantic uh, domestic carrier in the States, point. Uh, 36 billion and uh, Munich Re, which is another uh, gigantic reinsurance uh, entity, right at 822 million. This was pulled uh, earlier, so just after the end of the second quarter, I believe, this year. Uh, the thing with COVID is uh, it's an ongoing evolving occurrence, if you will. Uh, we don't know the end. We don't know uh, where losses are gonna end up. We don't know who's gonna pay, who's not gonna pay, so on and so forth. Um, Artemis, uh, another little clip in here. Uh, Artemis, I believe it's on, yeah, this page, sorry. Oh yeah, uh, insured losses reserves uh, settling related to the ugh, related to the pandemic has reached twenty one point five billion by early August, and Lloyd's accounting for three point six five billion of that in in total losses. Uh, and it could reach, we could be hit the hundred million, one hundred twenty million billion, one hundred twenty billion. Sorry, uh, Mark pretty soon. Uh, so in my world, doing mostly property, uh, the most I've seen have been business income uh, losses. Oops. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to share a different screen now. Uh, I will send this document if you guys want. Uh, and you guys can share it and it's got a lot of really good stuff in it. 
uh, as it relates to the property state of market. There we go. Okay. Um, so my role when I do property quotes and binders and such, uh, I am looking for basically to, uh, when I'm underwriting a risk as it relates to BI, I'm making sure they're insured properly and um, not overinsured and do they even need it? Um, most cases you do, uh, as any business, any business should have some sort of business income and at least they should have extra expense, which is a different form. Uh, with that being said, uh, I have three examples of claims uh, that we have gotten in my office specifically. Um, and 99.9% .9 of the claims so far for business income related to COVID have been declined. And we'll get into this in a second. Uh, the reason for that being there's no physical damage to the space which they occupy. If you had to shut down due to a government order, that's not exactly a covered, what we call a covered cause of loss. Um, the first example I have is, where is it? Sorry, trying to operate two computers here, it's very fun. Uh, the first one is a restaurant uh, up in Sanford. I happen to actually know the owner. Um, he's been a friend of mine for a period of time and he made a claim on, let's see, first notice of loss was, when was it? Uh, so 320. So basically three days after state of Florida was shut down. Um, he sued for loss of use, BI, basically business income. And it was initially declined. Uh, again, no physical damage. Uh, and that one is currently in litigation or headed that way. We just had to send the uh, certified copy of the policy out. So that, that's a good one. Um, the second one I have is, again, another property policy. Uh, first notice of loss was, let's see, 4-1. Uh, uh, Due to uh, description of loss, due to stay at home order from Florida governor, their tenant has failed to pay rent and insured his filing claim under their business interruption coverage for loss of rents of 3,500 a month. Again, no physical damage. This one has not been settled yet, I believe. Has not. Um, but this one is probably headed for a declination as well. Uh, my third one, and this is where we'll get into some fun policy language, because I know everybody loves that, uh, is a comedy club in Arizona. And this one I actually have a denial letter on. I can't show you, but it'll, I'll quote the exact policy language for you on why it was declined. Um, so they filed first notice on 315 again, right after everything shut down. And we re claim was sent on 327 and the declination letter came almost the same day uh, within the week, uh, which was very surprising. Um, so let's get, I wanna get into this one, exactly why it was declined. So let's see, where are we? Okay. Where did we? There we go. 
share my screen again. So in the denial letter, they go through basically coverage and then at the end, they tell you why not. So this one, they lay out the business income, what it is, how it's defined. And then under additional coverages, They cite this right here. Which is civil authority. Uh, and then I'm going to get out of this one. Oh, wrong mouse. And then the denial, ooh, sorry, the denial goes into the special cause of loss form. This one right here. And this is where they get the denial. So special cause of loss is the broadest form that I deal with in uh, property coverage. It's an ISO form. Uh, 0917 is the latest version. Uh, I wish I could tell you the exact changes from year after year, but it, there's so many of them recently, it uh, gets confusing. <laughs> uh, so the difference between the special cause of loss, basic and broad forms, which are the other two cause of loss forms, uh, is it, instead of listing what is actually covered, it lists what is excluded. Uh, so, and if you go, where is it? I gotta find it again. <laughs> Number two, where did that link? Oh, there we go. I already had it highlighted. Look at that. <laughs> so this is where they found that exclusion for this particular one. And it's delay, loss of use, or loss of market, which is an exclusion. So since, again, no physical damage, just because you lost the use of it, it would be excluded for, for that claim. Um, Lloyd's has been sued, uh, <laughs> in case you weren't aware. There is a class action lawsuit that was filed. I can't remember exactly where. Uh, we got a notice about it. God, in April, I think it was. Uh, so there's still so many things happening uh, with regards to COVID and with coverages. Zurich released a product within two months of it being actually declared a pandemic. The minimum premium on it was $100,000 and they had to shut it down within three months of it be actually being in existence. Um, so let's go, okay. I'll go to my, back to my outline. <laughs> ah, yes, okay. So in addition to those specific uh, exclusions within the ISO form, most companies, uh, insurance companies will have a vir uh, oh, well, let me see, they all word it differently. Uh, usually it's a communicable disease, pathogen, virus type of exclusion uh, in their policies. I don't wanna, I don't have a good example of it because they're all different. They're all worded different. Uh, 
but it's something to always be on the lookout for. Uh, it was mentioned in this declination uh, in addition to the exclusion found on the special form. Uh, this one was specifically called exclusion of patho pathogen, pathogenic or poisonous biological or chemical materials. Uh, and it states, Uh, the discharge, dispersal, seepage, migration, release, escape, or application of the path pathogenic or poisonous biological or chemical materials is accidental and is not the result of willful malicious act, any person's organization or property of any nature. Uh, so yeah, it gets really wordy. And it basically says, if you, you know, if anyone, if you're shutting down because of this not covered. Um, let's see next. So with all that, uh, best advice I can give uh, when you're talking to your clients is always, I, I tell this to my retail clients all the time and that's to make sure you review every form uh, in the entire policy. Uh, make sure their clients read it and then make sure they understand the language that it's in. Uh, and another, uh, another thing I always tell or an insured should know is uh, always use well-established, experienced, competent retail agents when they are shopping their insurance. There's plenty of them out there. I deal with them all day. Uh, but that's probably the most important thing that they can, that they can do. Uh, they always have best interests of the insured first. Um, I go through it all the time, you know, back and forth. Uh, with my clients and getting this form moved, getting this form removed, pricing, all of that. So um, does anyone have any questions? I'm not gonna quite take up an hour. So I would love to hear questions. If anyone has any, you can just type away. No. <laughs> Hey John, could you yeah. um, give somebody, could you give the viewers an example of a claim that may, you know, have been processed? It doesn't necessarily have to be directly COVID related, but is there like maybe a looting claim you could talk about from the recent activities or anything like that? Um, since you've talked all about claims that were denied, maybe right. there's something that you could say had been processed um, that is in related to Okay. You know, what, yeah. kind of what's going on uh, from what we, so obviously not much of that here in Florida and 95% of my business is here in Florida. Uh, so we haven't seen much of that at all. Uh, the losses have eclipsed the, the billion dollar mark in the cities where it has happened. Um, and if, let me go back into the, uh, So let me go back into the special cause of laws form here. Because rioting, civil commotion is a covered cause of loss. So I just got to find it. That is a good question though, Sam, because I know it's, it has happened a lot and they're, they have been paying claims. Uh, oh, all right, I guess that's, uh, so easy to read over this stuff. Like you won't even find, like totally miss it. <laughs> Wow. 
that's weird. Yeah, basically it's gonna fall under vandalism for lack of a better term, uh, which is a covered cause of loss. So I don't have any specific ones that we've encountered in my office, but I do know that we have been paying, like I said, we have been paying them. They have been paid uh, from both domestic and uh, ENS carriers. So it's definitely something to consider when, uh, when advising clients on what to purchase. And again, this uh, vandalism would not be covered under the basic form and it would not be covered under the broad form as well. So, and it also can be excluded with a vacancy permit from the special form. So though they would tack the CP0450 onto a policy and that it states that any building vacant for 60 days uh, vandalism and theft then become excluded if it is vacant for that long. So be careful of that form as well. And that's why we would rather have a building occupied than not occupied from an insurance standpoint. So does that help Samuel? Yeah, that was, that was good. I know this is a pandemic panel, so <laughs> I know that that's mostly COVID related, but you know, that yeah. with everything going on, um, right, right, right. Reason. Absolutely. John, if the yeah. third is in a state where there's a lot of COVID cases and they're having, you know, business interruption problems, um, right. there are no government mandates to shut down or wear masks, um, mm -hmm. would insurance kick in at that, in that uh, situation? I'm sorry, I missed, I kind of missed the first part of that. Yeah, so if you're if you're in a state or a county um, and there's um, you know a surge in COVID cases, correct, right? Uh, but there's no government mandates um, for shutdowns. Um, what are there any coverage issues there? It's still, as far as like a business income loss, no, because it's not necessarily the 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 sh the shutdown. It's you know, there has to be a physical damage to your building that is, that was created by a covered cause of loss within the policy. Oh, and another thing I forgot to mention. So in 2001, when September 11th happened, there was obviously billions of dollars lost in, from an insurance standpoint uh, in New York. And we created the Terrorism Risk Insurance Protection Act uh, of 2001. It's been extended, I believe, three times now. Um, it's up actually to be extended at the end of this year. Uh, so what a lot of carriers and um, the legislature, the United States legislature will probably do is put together some sort of product like that where you'll be able to opt in when you when you bind your policy. So you'll be able to for an additional premium to say like anywhere from 50 to $500, uh, they'll give you uh, pa like pandemic loss coverage basically is what it would be. So it'll, that hasn't been, it hasn't come to fruition yet, but that's one of the ideas on the table uh, within the industry. And that would be, you know, the, the large carriers, a lot of Lloyd's representatives and, uh, and, the, and the United States legislature working together and they would both chip in on, on both sides to, to create a fund for that. So, so that's something that to look forward to, hopefully. Hopefully we never have a pandemic again, but. <laughs> All right, well, I think if nobody else has any questions, um, we'll take probably about a half hour break. Our next speakers are gonna be closer to 110. Um, so a little short on this one, but at least it's lunchtime so everybody can go and have a meal or make phone calls, check emails, whatever. Uh, we do plan to resume uh, with the attorney panel uh, promptly at 110. So if there's no other questions for John, we're gonna conclude for now. Uh, if anybody has a subsequent question after this that they would like to ask John, please just get in touch with me. Um, I'd yeah, be happy perfect. to make an email introduction for you. Yeah, thank so, you, Samuel, I appreciate that.
no problem. And we will resume uh, promptly at 110. Cool. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, John. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to session two. Um, our panelists are all here and ready to go. So I'm going to get started with introductions. Uh, first up, we have my boss, Thomas Zender. Tom is a shareholder with King Blackwell, Zender, and Warmoth PA. Uh, Tom's practiced primarily as a commercial litigator in Orlando since he graduated with honors from the University of Florida College of Law in 1995. Tom has represented both individuals and corporations in a wide variety of complex matters in state and federal courts, in arbitration and on appeal. Throughout his legal career, Tom has been active in taking leadership positions with the Orange County Bar Association. He first served in the Young Lawyers section, including as its president from 2005 to 2006. In 2011 to 2012, Tom served as president of the OCBA, and in 2012 to 2013, he served as president of the OCBA Foundation. In 2006, Tom received the OCBA's highest honor awarded to a young lawyer, the Lawrence G. Matthews Jr. Young Lawyer Professionalism Award. In 2004, Tom received the Florida Bar's Young Lawyer Division Pro Bono Award, um, a statewide service award presented by the Florida Supreme Court and the Florida Bar's YLD that recognizes extraordinary contributions in the provision of pro bono services. Welcome, Tom, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And next up, we have Blair Jackson. Blair graduated from the University of Alabama with an LLM in business transactions. He's taught business classes at both the Crummer School of Business at Rollins College and Barry Law School. Mr. Jackson's practice focuses on representing small businesses in litigation and transactional matters. Welcome, Blair, and thanks for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, and last but not least, we have Drew Sorrell. Drew is a shareholder at Lounds, where he chairs its cybersecurity and privacy practice group, as well as its COVID-19 task force. Drew's practice focuses on complex commercial issues relating to both litigation and contract drafting. He has years of experience litigating business matters, intellectual property infringement disputes, data privacy issues, wire fraud, uh, insurance coverage, personal injury, and employment litigation. Likewise, he has significant experience drafting and negotiating software licenses, internet service provider agreements, data privacy policies and procedures, employment agreements, as well as the indemnity and insurance coverage provisions related to those agreements. Drew is a founding member of the Sedona Conference Group 11 on data privacy and is frequently asked to speak and write on legal and ethical issues arising from technology, including unfair and deceptive trade practices, data breach, privacy, data governance, and technology contract drafting. He is the former chair of the OCBA's Intellectual Property Committee, the Business Law Committee, and the Technology Committee, and he was also the past president of the Orlando chapter of the FBA. Uh, welcome, Drew, and thanks for being here. And now I'm going to turn things over to our moderator, Catherine Wynn. Catherine is on currently serving on the um, Business Law Committee's Executive Board. She's a graduate of the University of Florida College of Law and has been practicing as a lawyer in Florida since 2018. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Robin. All right, so we're gonna start this session with our litigation strategy related questions. Overall, how has litigation strategy changed since the pandemic? I'll start. <laughs> If I can. Um, so uh, I'm Tom Zender. Thank you guys very much uh, for, for joining us in this seminar. Um, so how does it affect litigation strategies? It's interesting. You know, there's kind of two pieces to this uh, as I was thinking about this issue. You know, one from the lawyer's perspective, one from the client's perspective. Um, for, for litigators, um, at least in my view, uh, we, we do a lot of planning and strategy based on um, how we think the case schedule is going to progress. 
you know, in federal court, obviously, you know that very early on with your um, case management report and the case management scheduling order that gets issued. You know your trial date and your deadlines, and you strategize based on those deadlines about what depositions you're going to take and when, how your motion practice is going to go, those sorts of things. In state court, it's a little different, obviously, because you typically don't have a trial order until you're into the case a little bit. But nevertheless, you have the comfort of deadlines, and that informs decisions and strategy. When COVID hit, all that went away. And so now the strategies, the, the timelines, the, the schedules you had in place uh, all evaporated. And so uh, I know here uh, at our firm, we sort of scrambled a little bit and tried to figure out how we were gonna react to that. And, and you know, that's what we do. And so we, we have managed that uh, as best we could. I think what's more interesting though is how it's impacted the clients you know, um, in, in my experience, uh, cases, clients, um, uh, if they're involved in significant litigation, understand that it's, they're, they're in it for a reason. In other words, they, they believe that they need a, a judicial resolution for, to whatever dispute uh, they're in. What COVID has done, at least in some of our significant cases, is change the way clients uh, evaluate risk. Um, in, in this unbelievable environment of uncertainty, I've seen in a couple of our significant cases, the clients totally changed their risk tolerance. And now suddenly they're looking for certainty wherever they can get it, even in litigation. And so we we're in the process of settling two of our biggest cases. And I think it's in large part because of COVID because they just don't, they got bigger problems to worry about now suddenly. You have sort of a re reassessment of your priorities, and so that's been a fascinating thing and a, a way that it's impacted um, our practice and certainly our strategies going forward. And kind of adding on to that, I've noticed too that, at least in my opinion, I think a litigator is most effective when they're in the presence of the person that they're working with. So, for instance, if you're with the judge and you're physically in the presence of the judge. I think you do a much better job of reading the room and the reactions and getting your point across mm -hmm. versus having to say your mic's muted or you broke up there or repeat yourself or stuff like that. Um, I also have been involved in depositions during COVID, which are video related. And the same thing I think applies, which is I think it is much easier to pull together uh, a, a deposition, but at the same time, I just don't think they're quite as effective because at least in the, the ones that I've seen and been involved with, you've got a party on one end and then you've got the attorney and sitting there with them in most cases, and then the adverse attorney and perhaps the adverse party, and it all looks kind of like a video game versus you being present and having what I would say the, the, the force of your personality sitting there next to the person and trying to get results out of that deposition. I just don't think we are as effective from a distance standpoint, counterbalancing that, this is to some extent also echoing Tom. I think the clients are happier though, because you take out some of the cost associated with lawyers litigating cases, for instance, with respect to travel and things like that. Um, I don't like it. I like being next to people. I guess I'm old fashioned, but I, I think it gets done and it moves along. Blair, do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all, all good points so far. And, and, and probably sort of, sort of saying the same thing that these guys are saying, but, you know, since the pandemic, it seems like, you know, that the sort of sharp edge that you would use on whatever side that you're on as leverage has kind of been removed. And the, and the clients sort of have an understanding of that when you explain to them the reality of, you know, when a trial uh, could conceivably take place in their case and what they're looking at with potential damages and so forth, which is obviously constantly changing when, uh, you know, when the business or clients going through a pandemic, I represent a lot of small businesses. So I'm, I'm surprised, certainly some of the venom that you, uh, that you sometimes see that, you know, attorneys will employ and I've employed it as well, where you're trying to, you know, you're trying to say, well, we need to move this along and we've got an excellent, you know, motion that we can file and we can force this to a, a, a conclusion that's beneficial to our clients, uh, to our client, some of that is removed and you're more in a mediation posture. And sometimes 
And I've been surprised to see, I guess, a little bit, and maybe it's after explaining what the reality of our situation is, that it's the client that says, can you reach out to the other attorney? Uh, you know, uh, we know that oftentimes clients in litigation or about to be litigating a case against each other, you know, hate the other person or entity to begin with. And I've been pleasantly surprised to see, you know, uh, at least some conversation about, you know, making communication with and trying to connect with uh, an attorney on, on the opposing side to try to get something done. So it seems like it's sort of a large reality check on everybody. And the clients are going through, you know, they're, they're not attorneys, but, um, but they're going through similar situations in terms of having to make deals or concessions with, you know, their vendors, et cetera. And so there, there seems to be sort of a commonality and experience that's helping get cases resolved. And I resolved a lot of cases, as I'm sure these guys have during this pandemic that I don't think ever would have been resolved if it weren't for the fact that the virus has kind of thrown us together to trying to find another way forward. You know? Right. Um, so our next question is, are you finding that the pandemic has slowed your practice at all? And I'll start with Tom. You know, um, it, we've been lucky, uh, very fortunate that, that when this thing hit, um, our stable of cases um, were in such a state where we, we could keep kind of doing what we were doing. It was, uh, at the time, it was a lot of electronic discovery type stuff, motion practice. The courts did a great job, you know, keeping hearings going telephonically or, or through Zoom. Um, one thing we did do uh, was was reorganize and push back key depositions, kind of like what Drew was saying before, uh, and Blair as well. You know, the 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 idea of taking a document intensive deposition in a hotly contested case um, over Zoom uh, is not ideal. At least we haven't gotten super excited about that prospect yet. Um, one of these days, we probably are going to have to do it. But but that definitely impacted us and slowed things down in that respect. Um, which, which you know, is frustrating for the client and, and, and your prosecution of the case and getting it ready for um, that dispositive motion phase. But overall, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's impacted us as litigators um, less than I would have suspected, even with the, the sort of reprioritizing we've been talking about and cases settling that maybe you didn't think would settle. We've still managed, thank, thank, thank the maker, uh, to, to be busy. So that's good. For a guy who sells his time for a living, that's good. Drew and Blair, do you have anything to add? I'll just add quickly, not necessarily from a personal standpoint, but just because I see what's going on at the firm. In, in March and April, I would say that there was a precipitous drop where everybody was contracting and nobody was busy. Um, and that's because nobody quite knew what was going to happen next and clients weren't really excited about incurring legal fees. Um, had a couple of deals die just because they weren't certain what was going to happen. And then since that time, it's been slowly coming back. And then I would say since the end of the summer, the firm, I would say, is now once again fully busy again. Uh, the, the type of work we're doing is a little bit different, but um, just kind of a, a general statement of recovery and the the line, I would say that we're pretty much back to where we were uh, pre-closure, if you will. And uh, yeah, I would just add that uh, it seems like I'm handling a lot more uh, defense cases than I am plaintiff's cases. Oftentimes, I believe they were situations that were sort of ready to go before the pandemic, and then they just decided to file. So quite a few uh, small business, hey, I've, you know, I've just been sued, and it was probably in the hopper already. But uh you know, my experience has been a little different. Our firm, it didn't seem like there was a drop off immediately. And I think maybe part of that was because small businesses were getting PPP and, and uh, uh, the, the tax deadlines were pushed off a little bit. And then it seemed to sort of be business as usual. And then I saw more of a drop off a little bit towards the end of the summer where it didn't seem like there was an end to this. And I mean, we could all just sit here and say, you know, is this, phase two, is this wave two? Is this, are we uh, still in the, the first phase of the pandemic? So it's been a little bit, you know, more spotty, but uh, 
Certainly, I think, at least from my perspective, the client that's coming in that is, uh, or speaking to me about whether they should file a lawsuit against an individual or an entity, I think that they're, uh, you know, that's that's become a different, a diff more difficult, I think, uh, client to land than somebody who's, you know, being sued and they have 20 days to respond and they're, you know, they're just trying to, you know, throw up some some uh, barriers to so that they're not, you know, being placed in default, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, have you had any remote trials, mediations, or evidentiary hearings? And I'll start with Blair first. Uh, sure. Um, I had uh, one remote small claims trial. Uh, it didn't get off the ground, and I think this suggests one of the other uh, questions that you may ask. Um, there was a, it was against a pro se um, defendant, and I was brought in to the case by someone who was pro se. And the judge had concerns, even though it looked like there was service of process and the defendant knew to be there appearing virtually for the bench trial, that they didn't get proper notice. And against my strenuous objection, I was, it was decided that we should reset the the trial and the judge requested that I, which ended up being an order, I guess, to uh, to send out my own notice in addition to the court's notice to make sure that they were present. So, and I had taken, you know, uh, great pains to get my witnesses uh, to make sure that they were lined up in the queue appropriately and, and we were ready to go. But just, you know, this is the kind of stuff that happens and the judge was erring on the side of caution. I don't think you would have seen that in a uh, non-pandemic situation, so. True, hmm. have you had any remote trials, mediations, or evidentiary hearings? I have not. Um, mine has been pretty much non-evidentiary at this point, uh, but it's, it, like I talked about earlier about the couple of depositions and things like that. This is exactly what Tom said. Dealing with documents via Zoom is just a nightmare. And so we have tried very hard not to have to do that when we can avoid it. Um, anyway, that's that's my answer. Tom, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so um, I was super skeptical of, uh, and I see my friend Lawrence Colon is participating, uh, of, of how Zoom mediation would work. Um, talked to some folks about it and their experiences with it. Um, just because at the time I had a case of, at the top of mind that that involves more of a personal dispute than anything else like a 20-year relationship that had gone bad between these two guys and and you know i've seen in my my years of practice that that there's a comes a time in the mediation process where if you need a breakthrough uh you can get it sometimes with a with a personal interaction or connection and i feared that through zoom we wouldn't we wouldn't um be able to accomplish that that said um, that case hasn't been mediated yet, but it's about to be. I had another one and it was a wild success. I mean, it, it, it went so much better than I thought it would, would go. Um, even though you have the, the technological limitations of, you know, not knowing where the mediator is exactly at the time, you know, when you're in somebody's office, you can kind of figure that stuff out, figure out who, uh, he or she is talking to at the time and things sidebar you know in the hallway and stuff you do to try to move things along uh but but i was really um uh, pleasantly surprised at how well it went um and the only other thing i've done via zoom is just hearings um not evidentiary haven't had to to tackle that fortunately yet uh but but the courts have done a great job uh, i know chief judge meyer has been working hard on this facilitating those kinds of hearings and getting ramped up to do it right and we we've had our you know, we stumble out of the gate sometimes and have the mute button on and things like that. But for the most part, it's actually gone much better than I would have would have expected. Well, that's yeah. great to hear. Um, when the shutdown first occurred, we saw a lot of judges freely granting extensions for delays caused by working remotely and the like. Have you experienced any impatience by judges recently or a desire to get cases back on track and thus less willing to grant extensions or continuances? I have, the, especially in the federal bar. Um, I think the the time of the freely given COVID extension is now over. And I, I don't think that you're gonna get 
that is just a simple COVID's involved and it's a pain in the butt judge. Can I have more time? I just don't think that's going to be granted anymore. Um, and what I've been seeing is that judges are, especially, like I said, the federal judges who, as we all know, normally rigorously control their docket have gotten back into that habit and are doing exactly that yet again. So I, I think we're just going to have to deal with it. Yeah, I, I think if I can add something, I just think the courts are in a tough spot. You know, I mean, they, they everything stopped uh, at, a, at a screeching halt, came to a screeching halt. And, and uh, you know, not only in federal court, of course, as Drew's talking about, but state court, especially. And you've got the criminal docket that, that, that is also um, sort of the 400 pound gorilla in the room. And so I found in some of my cases, I had one that was set for trial in June, a jury trial, which of course we didn't have. And I'm on now the, what they're calling the COVID trial docket, which is, which is just a list of cases in order. Um, so I'm not set for trial and yet the court has still imposed deadlines that ordinarily you actually wouldn't face. Like for example, a discovery cutoff, you know, typically in state court is about a month before the trial. Well, now I have one, even though I have no trial in sight. And I think that the courts are doing the best they can to try to um, put, put structure in place to move cases along, hopefully to resolve them if they can and, and clear those, those docket backups. I, I presume that that is what's going on and, and I can certainly appreciate that. So it's been interesting to see how that continues to play out as we move towards hopefully a, a reopening. Although who knows, uh, I guess we're headed for our third spike here. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just throw my two cents in. Um, I, I've seen judges, in my experience anyway, it seems like most judges are uh, understanding of continuances and extensions. They're not understanding of you not getting with, you know, opposing counsel to try and get these things worked out. That's um, a great point. I, I'm, I'm happy to say that I haven't been, you know, in that in that line of fire yet. But I've, you know, we're all on these, you know, group calls where you can hear other hearings happening and and so forth. And uh, and oftentimes the attorney will use the excuse, well, you know, it's because of the virus or or whatever. But you know, the judge is like, you can pick up a phone. I mean, there's there's really no excuse for that to happen. So I've seen some judges, you know, really lose it on that. And um, I think it really, um, you know, meet and confer used to be just this idea that, well, this is a formality. I'm probably not going to be able to get this thing worked out. But I see more now the importance of that as we do more uh, hearings and things virtually, because it also gives you the opportunity to speak to different issues and things that you can then bring up in front of the judge. And most judges are understanding of the fact that their impediments because of COVID, but I think it's maybe taken this thing that used to be just sort of a formality and maybe attached a little more importance on it, you know? And I've, I've seen judges, at least in my experience, you know, bring this up like, well, did you, in your meeting confer, did you discuss this other issue or whatever, which could be pure logistics or a legal issue, so, you know. Catherine, if I can, just, just to build on that, I think Blair's making a great point. It's been interesting to see, you know, this is my own failing, but, but I've, I've found over the years, I've gotten much more into the habit of emailing with, with my opponents mm -hmm. than doing what we used to do, which is pick up the phone and talk to them. And in this environment, uh, obviously email is still, still something, uh, a dominant means of communication, but, but I'm on the phone way more now than I ever was. And, and that has been uh, an unexpected benefit I think from this pandemic and sort of returned me personally to that kind of um, type of, of sort of interpersonal dynamic of practicing law with people and, and talking through issues because mm -hmm. Blair is exactly right. I've had judges say, well, when was the last time you guys talked to each other? You know, everybody's like, well, your honor, you know, we're remote and the, you know, everyone's trying to bob and weave about that, but it's, it's an excellent question and an excellent point. And it's just been interesting to see in my practice how I think I've gotten, I've learned that lesson and kind of returned to a more one-on-one -on -one direct communication with, with my opponent. And it's, it's, I think it's better for the client when you're yeah. doing that. I mean, that's, that's part of the zealous advocacy, you know, duty that we all have is, is communicating with your opponent, however frustrating that may be. 
doing it because most of the time, at least in this community, when we're very fortunate to be in the community we're in practicing law here, you, you get things done that way. And yeah. so I think that's good. a great segue into my next question. Um, from a discovery perspective, have you experienced any opposing parties thwarting document production by citing COVID shutting down offices or staff working from home? I've had, uh, yeah, go ahead, Drew. I've had a little bit, and, and, but not anything significant, meaning this person's not here and this person's out or this person's sick and those kinds of expected things. Um, it was a little bit of flexibility because in my opinion, most discovery um, timing matters are really not that important unless you're set for trial. Um, and so I think a little bit of flexibility earns you some flexibility back. Um, and like I said, I think that we've now come out of that hole in the sense that I think most people are back up to speed and people are figuring out how to work remotely. And so I just don't think that well, I can't get it to you because of COVID. I don't think that's a valid excuse anymore. And I think most people recognize that. Blair, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, well, I would just say I, delays, yes. And I'm guilty of it as well. I haven't seen actual thwarting and hopefully I have not thwarted anybody, you know, with respect to the, they're just not receiving, you know, the client's discovery. But I found that we're all in the same boat. It, it, it appears that, for the most part, I, there, other than a couple of exceptions, um, you know, opposing counsel, uh, we're all kind of in the same boat, like, hey, I'm going to need a little more time getting this to you. Uh, and then I'm, I'm like, hey, that's fine, but I'm going to need more time doing this as well. So not, not sort of out and out, um, you know, just obstinance, not turning anything over, but, you know, delays. And so far, at least in my experience, just it seems like there are reasonable delays under the circumstances. Yeah, same experience for me. I mean, no, nobody has done anything intentional. I don't think we have either. Everybody's kind of in the same boat. So things are slower, I would say, than they, than they typically are. Um, but we've managed to work through that and, and figure out how to remotely um, still comply with gathering documents and things like that. Um, which has been neat and a way to build efficiency going forward. I think we've, we've learned, Drew would know way more about this than I would, but, but we've learned how to get better at that. Um, back in the old days, right? You'd go on site with your client and you'd look through their cabinets and you're, you figure out at least their, their, their system and their server setup and things like that. But we've managed to do some of that uh, remotely even. And, and so it's taken a little longer, but it's actually, I think, gonna pan out in the long run being more, more efficient. So my next question is, in business disputes, often there's a need to value the equity holder's interest in the company. How has COVID impacted these business valuations, i.e. do you use a valuation date that is pre or post pandemic? How do you analyze fair market value and do you apply a COVID discount? I'm Blair. Well, I, I certainly think that it needs to be factored into, you know, uh, whether you're in litigation. I have a couple of these situations actually pre-litigation where we're at least talking to uh, talking to each other about getting a business valuation. But that's definitely been part and parcel of any discussion that we've had on either the plaintiff or defense side about how to value a business, you know. Um, I've sort of seen it used uh, by at least opposing counsel in a couple of situations as a way to you try to just argue that because of the virus, uh, you know, the, the business therefore is not worth as much as, as it should be without any real support or documentation to, you know, to, to, to support that position, you know, so, um, but I think, uh, you know, it's probably malpractice not to, you know, to analyze and, and make sure that that's built into the numbers on whatever side you're, whatever side you're on. Yeah. Tom and Drew, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Blair makes a great point there. Um, you know, it's just, it's so interesting how, how this circumstance has changed how you, you evaluate all sorts of things. And it kind of back to my first point, just watching the way clients react to it, I think is, is just fascinating. Um, so 
I think Blair is dead on in, in terms of what he was saying there. Okay. My comments would just be repetitive of what Blair had to say. Okay, um, so my next question is, have any of your cases been affected by any of the parties, witnesses, attorneys, or judges contracting COVID? And what issues arose and how are they addressed? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, we, we haven't had anybody, um, you know, test positive that couldn't appear to a deposition or or counsel in a case, you know, fall out of something because of a, of a COVID scare. Um, in, our, in our firm though, you know, when, when COVID hit, uh, we shut down uh, probably mid-March, March 16th, something like that. Um, and then watched and, and like, I guess many of us thought that Florida had largely dodged this thing somehow, miraculously. Um, and we managed to come up with the, the capital idea that we would reopen the week of June 8th. Um, and so we worked for a couple of weeks, you know, coming up with, with COVID protocols about all the things we were going to do and take temperatures and hand washing. And we had masks and isopropyl alcohol everywhere. And we still do. All that stuff is here. And how it was going to, you know, we're, we're controlling pathways and what stairs you're going to walk and all of that stuff. We lasted two days. <laughs> Uh, when when two two different employees came across somebody that was COVID positive, and so we we closed, and we haven't been uh, we we've been remote ever since, I should say. So mm. it, it's interesting how that has impacted us. Um, I haven't had it, you know, uh, in a case, but for our shop, it certainly and still impacts us. Now we're watching the case count and wondering. You know, every month we, we, or every week, I should say, we look, hey, is this the week we can reopen again? And, and we just keep postponing that decision, kicking the can down the road. And fortunately have learned to keep the lights on and the doors open, uh, uh, so to speak, um, through, through managing and learning how to work remotely. Uh, but it, it's, it's an ongoing challenge to figure out how to bring people back into the office in a safe environment that that makes sense, um, and and will will not you know lead to unintended consequences. Great. Since we have a data privacy guru here, we prepared a few questions for Drew related to security measures. Um, so Drew, I know your practice includes cybersecurity matters. How has remote working at law firms changed the security posture for those firms? <laughs> it, that's a very big question and I'm not sure if it's it, it's good to be called a guru or if that just means you're set up for a fall uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, what I would say is that I think overall the law profession is less secure now than it was in February and I say that because and I'm really not trying to be political but the United States was okay it was okay it was okay and then all of a sudden in March we're not okay and every law firm in the world scrambled to try and come up with a way to continue to operate but not be next to each other and the net result of that is some flavor of remote working for small shops big shops etc and it was very ad hoc not in most instances well thought out and from my perspective on our profession we were five to ten years away from being where we are now then um and so we have now leaped ahead to virtual working. And in my opinion, law firms are just now beginning to catch up with the security implications of that. And so to be more specific, if you hand a lawyer a firm laptop and you send them to their house, what you don't have is an answer to, well, are they leaving the laptop out in a secure area? Are they leaving it in a non-secure area? Who at the house has access to the laptop? What if the house is burglarized? This is a little bit silly, but it's a, it's a real issue. If they have internet connected devices that are hooked into the hub at the house for Wi-Fi, those, it's called island hopping. Those can be used to hop from one island to another if you were an intruder. So if I break into your web enabled whatever, and then I can get access to the rest of your network, I can now hop onto your work laptop. And if you don't have the laptop secured appropriately encrypted, multi-factor authentication, et cetera, et cetera, then you now have 
a home-based data breach problem for your law firm. And so compiling that, it, it used to be that law firms could fairly well contain in their envelope, their security perimeter. But now with these laptops everywhere, if we do have to respond to a breach as a law firm, we now have to figure out, well, how are we gonna do that in light of COVID? I don't really wanna go into somebody's house physically, but I may need to. How am I gonna find out who had access and all the pieces and parts that go into that? Um, all that leads you back to the, the basic question of there should be some serious thought given at this point for all law firms to think about, well, what, what have I not done that I need to be doing and how do I prove that you know John Smith who works in accounting is actually on my system at 2 a.m. and is actually working and that that's not some intruder from North Korea. Mm -hmm. All that to say, I think that we as a profession need to very quickly get to um, a reasonable level of security because I don't think we're there yet. Okay. Um, understood. Um, okay. So now we're going to move to the next segment, which is our general practice questions. From this entire pandemic, what is your biggest takeaway from a client relations and firm management perspective? Uh, Tom? Um, well, so starting with uh, firm management, it, it's kind of been um, what I was touching on before, which is just trying to figure out what the right thing to do is for, for our employees. You know, do we have them in the office? Uh, do, we, do we have them at home? What's the right call on that? Um, we, there was a lot of hand wringing and concern about our ability to, to you know, effectively represent the clients and do the job um, remotely. Could we pull that off, you know? And, and we're trying to balance that duty to the clients to, to the duty, obviously, to the employees to, to not risk anybody. And um, fortunately, uh, so far at least, we've kind of figured out how to, how to do this remotely, at least for now. And um, so we're just continuing that struggle about what's the right time, what's the right protocol, do we, and how do you treat, <laughs> there, there are folks in our office who are different, in different risk categories, you know, let's be honest, like people have different situations and can you do that? Can you say, hey, these folks can come back, but these folks can't. And how do you manage that? And so, so that, that continues to be a challenge in our small shop. I can't imagine what it would be like at Lowndes or you know, the big firms. Um, so we, we've definitely had challenges there. On, on client relations, um, you know, one of the, the most interesting things I think has been that you, you, we've lo I've lost the opportunity to, to sit down with clients which is something we, we do routinely in our cases. They're always here or we always go to their shop and, and sit down and talk to them because most of the time they're involved in something that's very significant. And that face-to-face -face contact um, I think is important in building trust and, and understanding what the client really wants and, and, and trying to meet the client's needs. This has thrown that, you know, uh, turned it upside down, obviously. And I've, I think I've had two in-person client meetings in nine months. Um, you know, we've done a lot of Zoom, <laughs> a lot of stuff like this, but that, that I think has, has hurt, um, at least it's hurt my uh, practice in the sense that I don't feel as effective as I, I think I could be if I'm sitting with somebody, um, you know, and, and hearing what they have to say as opposed to being on the phone or, or over, over the computer. And, and of course, clients have different notions of COVID mm -hmm. and their behaviors are different. And, you know, how do you, how do you meet that? If you have a different view of what's appropriate and what's good and makes sense in terms of meeting in person versus the client and how do you manage that? So we've had some of those situations and it's, it, it's like I said, with the employees, same thing. It's just a continuing learning process and a struggle to try to walk that line and make sure that you're meeting your obligations and not disappointing your client, but, but doing what you think is right and, and safe. Right. Blair, what's your biggest takeaway from a client relations or first uh, firm management perspective? Well, I think, and I think Tom mentioned this earlier too, which is I am picking up the phone a lot more. I am communicating with clients sometimes, uh, you know, two or three times in the same week to make sure that they fully under, that, that we're staying connected to the extent that we can when we're working remotely. 
but also because they want that hand on their shoulder, I guess. In this case, it would be the virtual hand on the shoulder because they can't be in the same room with you. And I don't know if these guys agree or disagree, but you know that that buys you a lot of goodwill when you're able to obviously sit in the same room with your client and they, they feel that connection, but you have to work harder at it when you aren't able to do that. I also think that it probably has made me a better attorney because I realized that, you know, uh, especially when you were explaining a case or a potential client is speaking with you over the phone, you have to drill down even more and I think be even more clear about expectations and what you're doing and making sure that they understand exactly what's going on because, you know, uh, th there's something about actually being in a room with a client where sometimes you know, we've all gotten comfortable. We've all been doing this for a while where, you know, you feel like you can sort of talk in shorthand. And when you can't see the client, it's like, I've got to make sure that they truly understand what is going on here. So probably in that perspective, sort of it, it's tied, I think, for the most part, not 100%, but bound me closer with the clients. And they're truly more understanding of, uh, what we're all going through and they appreciate that little contact that they used to say, yeah, okay, great. Now they hold on to it like it's gold, even if it's just an email or a quick phone call to say, how are you doing? Or the last time we talked a few days ago, you know, I, I neglected to mention this. So let me make sure that you understand this. And at least in my experience, I'm getting back. Most clients are so grateful for that, you know, so it's probably made me a better attorney. To all, when all is said and done, and hopefully we're looking for silver linings in the midst of all this stuff that we're dealing with. You know. well, that's great to hear. Um, and uh, Drew, do you have anything to add? I was just going to say that marketing has become an interesting proposition. Because I'm sure like all of you, it used to be, hey, I need to go meet this person for lunch, grab a beer, something. Mm -hmm. And that just doesn't happen anymore. And trying to find and prospect and meet new people and things like that that need lawyer services has become, in my opinion, amazingly challenging just because you're not out in the community doing the things you normally would do and kind of brushing up against people. Um, it's, it's a little bit different to be on a Zoom call with someone and then say, hey, can I Zoom you later so we can chat or whatever. That just is an awkward proposition. Um, it's forced our firm to, you know, marketing department, to come up with some new ideas on how we do some of the marketing that we do. But I just don't think it's as valuable as the old fashioned get to know people. And again, as Blair would say, uh, put your hand on their shoulder as long as that's appropriate and welcome. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for cleaning that up for me. I just, that. just, just helping you out there. So anyway, I think it's just a different world we live in, and hopefully we come up with a cure fairly soon and can get back to the old-fashioned ways. Because I'd much rather drink a beer than talk to somebody on a Zoom call, um, or drink a beer on a Zoom call. Anyway. Okay. So this question is for all of you. Um, are there any practice areas in your firms that have experienced surges or slowdowns due to COVID? What do you predict will happen to these practice areas in the future? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I'll start if that's okay. Uh, one of the thing we, fun things we do is um, some election law stuff and um, the pandemic, uh, no question, uh, resulted in sort of a ramp up of some of that activity for us. Um, as, as you know, obviously for obvious reasons, um, how the pandemic would, would have impact the, the election season, um, was top of mind for lots of different clients. And so we had some, um, some matters come up that otherwise definitely wouldn't have obviously. And, um, so that's been interesting. Um, and, and a, just a, I think, a, a, a objective, tangible example of how COVID has definitely impacted a line of cases that, that we wouldn't have. We've had just a couple of, you know, sort of force majeure type, you know, COVID related cases, nothing that went to litigation, um, but just some letter writing stuff. Uh, but other than that, those are the two examples that come to mind in terms of how COVID is immediately led to a case you wouldn't otherwise expect to, to bring in. 
Claire? I, I would say probably very broadly, just, you know, I do some transactional work and a lot of that is, uh, appears sadly, I think, to be a luxury that, um, you know, that a lot of small businesses can't afford anymore. You know, I've, I've put together some employment manuals before for companies and contract drafting and things of that nature. And I've seen a lot of that slow down. You know, you're getting more of the, you know, uh, or, or a person or, uh, you know, like a, a small business, you know, president will come in and, um, you know, just say, well, I've got this lawsuit I'm dealing with. And then I really want to, you know, have my whole employment manual reworked or I've got to rework my non-compete or whatever. And that's always now right on the, uh, on the total back burner. So I would say just in general, just anything that is, I guess, elective as opposed to something that needs to be dealt with, you know, immediately. Drew, have you seen any surges or slowdowns in work due to COVID? We, we surged April, May, June with respect to uh, landlord tenant issues and mm. with respect to uh, commercial agreements that were impacted by COVID. In particular, we have a, a large hotel practice and we helped a lot of hotels dealing with cancellations for um, COVID related reasons for seminars and things like that. Um, and then we also have a, a government practice that because of TDT funds going down was significantly impacted. And so there was a lot of layoffs that resulted from that. So employment law perked up as well. And then ancillary contracts that were affected. Um, all of that surged and went through the roof for a little while as far as are we going to litigate over this or how are we going to resolve it? And at this point, most of it seems to be resolving without litigation. Um, but the, just the counseling that goes into how you walk through those issues. Um, and then to echo what Blair said, I had some transactional software deals that were getting ready to go. And then they fell off the table because people just backed out of them and said, we're not doing that right now. Um, so it, but that I thankfully knock on wood seems to be coming back now and at least to the levels that we were before the shutdown. And then assuming that everybody doesn't die from the current wave, hopefully that will continue. Okay, so have you experienced client frustration in litigation cases or transactional work not moving at the same pace due to the pandemic? And if so, how do you handle explaining these issues to clients? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, like we talked about before, I mean, the, to, to explain to a client that suddenly they've lost their trial date, um, you know, after 18 months uh, that they thought they had a trial date, um, or to explain to a client that the schedule you just, you know, spent a bunch of time negotiating with the other side uh, to file a report, you know, in federal court and getting that that that's you know now off the table that that's that's been challenging um what what's interesting though in as as business litigators you know the clients are they're facing the same problem in their own businesses so that's helped in the sense that they get it uh, they're not happy about it but they understand uh that it's it turned everything upside down um so everybody's schedule uh is off um as a result of that but it's, it's led to, um, as I said before, when we started this, at least in my experience, I, I've, been, I've been amazed to see the way clients assess and tolerate risk differently in the litigation perspective in light of the ongoing uncertainty of COVID. And, and again, and just in my experience, at least, it's been sort of a rejiggering of, of, of trying to find certainty and maybe making a deal that they otherwise wouldn't have made. Uh, and, and to one of Blair's earlier points, I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of a silver lining in this. I mean, cases are getting resolved that, that should get resolved and maybe they're getting resolved sooner than they otherwise would have because of this situation. And that, you know, again, for a person who sells his hour by uh, time, uh, you know, by the hour is not a great thing. It's certainly better for the clients and um, ultimately, if you have a happy client, that's, you know, you've done your job. So that's been an interesting um, um, development, I think, uh, in terms of how it's impacted the outcomes of cases. 
Drew, how do you handle explaining these types of issues to clients? Well, I terribly enjoy telling my client, we're going to litigate the heck out of this. We're going to push it really hard. And maybe in a month or two, we'll have a hearing. And oh, by the way, maybe now in three months, we'll have a hearing because of COVID. And that's, you know, that's the zealous advocacy that we're left with at this point. Um, and then if you're in South Florida, the, <laughs> the, the timeline gets even more uh, mysterious as far as when you can actually press hard on that really killer motion you've just written. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just what these guys said, and and also, um, it just you're forced into a plan B. So, you know, I, I take them through. Sometimes, if it's a very difficult client, I've had a couple of situations where I had to literally lay out and read the Florida Supreme Court order, you know, to them and explain, you know, what the landscape was. But you know, they're business people, and like Tom said, they they. They're going through some of the same things in a different in different respect. So they will oftentimes look at you and say, well, what's plan B? Well, the only real plan B that we have is that I can get with opposing counsel. We both have issues. And let's see, you know, uh, if there's some commonality there or something that, you know, that, that we can work out. And really that's, um, you know, and, and I, I think what they understand is, Maybe unlike pre-pandemic where they're like, well, you're not getting this done fast enough. I'm going to go hire somebody else or your timeline for this because of my schedule, you know, it doesn't work for me as a client. I'm going to go find somebody that's maybe less busy that can handle this right away. They understand that maybe the next person they go to is going to be in the same boat as, as you are, or they have arrived with you because they've gone through four attorneys that are telling them the same thing. So I, I think there's been a certain amount of client education with respect to all this as well, you know, because oftentimes they're not just talking to one attorney. I mean, we all have repeat business, but they're sort of getting the picture, you know, to some extent. And maybe I, I don't want to, you know, disparage anybody else in any other practice area, but a lot of our clients, I think, tend to be a little more sophisticated than maybe the average person who is charged with a criminal matter or something like that. So they, they're, the tolerance level seems to be a little higher, you know. Mm -hmm. Assuming there is a return to normalcy, what are some procedures you think that courts, mediators, or arbitrators should keep that have worked well during the pandemic? And I'll start with Blair. Um, I, I've had good success with uh, virtual mediations and uh, probably the silver lining there, I don't want to be, you know, Mr. Hey, uh, everything's good news with this. There's, a, there's an upside to every downside, but I find that, you know, I, I think it was Tom that mentioned that, you know, we know by the nature of what we do, these things, sometimes they're fighting about money, but really it's become a personality issue and a grudge match. And if they have enough money, they can keep the grudge match going on for quite a bit of time. I found that some of that toxicity is removed when you're not physically in the same room with the other party at the beginning of the mediation. And uh, and it, a good mediator, and I, it seems like I've only worked with really good ones, um, you know, are good at knowing when to create the breakout rooms and what we need to look at. So it seems like sometimes a little bit of distance actually helps a case get resolved. So um, I'm much more open, you know, like, like Tom was saying, I think maybe now I'm much more open to the idea of a virtual mediation, whereas pre-virus, I couldn't conceive of it as being anything that where you could, where you could possibly settle anything. But it also, um, I think, creates an environment where people are more comfortable to sit down and talk. They're now not stuck in a conference room with a bunch of people they don't like, maybe including you as their attorney that they're not particularly fond of. They're in the comfort of their own home, perhaps, and I, I think that when you create that sort of that comfort, it, it probably lends itself to getting something settled. So those were my two cents, I guess, on that. Drew, what are some procedures that you think that courts, mediators, or arbitrators keep that have worked well during the pandemic? Well, here, and we talked about this very early on in this meeting, but I, I think that the presence of Zoom or its analogs is going to result in interesting sword and shield problems after the pandemic. And what I mean by that is, 
I need to take a deposition, but I need it to be on this date and that date because of travel. And then the response to that is, well, why don't we just do it by Zoom? And candidly, if I'm king of the world and can set my cases, which I can't, unfortunately, my cases to work the way I want them to, I'm going to want to take depositions in person and defend depositions by Zoom. And I'd like to do it. I don't know that I'm going to get that. Um, and I just think it's a, it's a tactic that I think is going to become in play. And I also think that some of the excuses that we had in the past, which were real, for courts about why things are taking so long, I think the technology has gotten to a point where that's just not going to be acceptable anymore. Yeah. And so it, I remember when I first started that mail and FedEx and fax were kind of the way you did things. And now 23 years later, that's just not the case anymore. And for better or worse, the practice of law has accelerated so fast that I think we lose something in it as a profession. Um, and I think that's just be going to become uh, more, more of a problem than it ever was. And one last thing, and I'll shut up. I think, too, that developing relationships with opposing counsel will be harder because, again, popping on Zoom means that I'm not spending 10 minutes drinking coffee with them before we start whatever we're doing. And I think that dispersonalization is probably detrimental to the practice. Hmm. Um, we have five more minutes. Um, I want to um, reach out to Tom and see if you had anything to add first before. Yeah, I just I, I really appreciated what 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 Drew just said there. I think that was super insightful about how how technology is going to be another tool uh, that can be used to to maybe gain advantage um, or create a disadvantage, and that that's a fascinating thing to see how that develops. But on that, the flip side of that is I, I do think that and I, I'm sure this will happen, I assume it will happen, I should say, that the courts, uh, I think, have demonstrated that Zoom hearings work. Um, you know, maybe not in every circumstance and evidentiary is gonna continue to be challenging, but certainly oral argument Zoom hearings work and, and they, are, they are way more efficient uh, for the client. Um, and so I think that's something the courts, you know, ought to keep and, and we should continue down that path. We'll get better at it and more effective at it. Um, but that, that seems to me to be a great benefit of, this, of these technological leaps that all of us have had to take in this environment. All right, so thank you so much. It looks like that's all we have time for before our next session starts. We're going to take a 10 minute break before session three. Please leave your Zoom meeting up in the background and check back in at 2.20 for the last session. Thank you so much for our, to our speakers and for your time. Thanks, everybody. Guys. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Stay really, guys. Yeah. Let's get started. Two twenty. Well, welcome back, everyone. It's two twenty. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as you all are aware, our third hour presenters are uh, Chief, Chief Judge Myers and uh, Judge Jordan. Just very brief introductions because I'm sure you all know of their qualifications. Um, Chief Judge. Myers is the chief judge of our circuit. He was elected to the bench in 2010. Uh, judge Jordan was elected to the bench in 2005. And upon reopening of business court or complex civil litigation division, he uh, has been serving in that role. Just, I think very shortly was Judge Fravor there and then uh, Judge Jordan took over. Um, if you guys have any questions for the judges, uh, Michael Piccolo will be handling that through the chat at the end. So just um, put them in the chat and Michael will address them at the end. Uh, Michael is an associate at Lounge and he is the event chair for the OCBA business committee. So you'll hear from him at the end with the CLE code and for any questions. Otherwise, uh, thank you, Judge Myers and Judge Jordan for your time. We all appreciate it. Well, Sam, thank you so much for inviting us to participate today. It's funny, I, I went back through my emails to try to locate the invitation that Judge Jordan and I received, and it was back in May, I think when we were a little more optimistic about where we might be today. Uh, because as I read the email and the topics that you asked for us to cover, uh, you were speaking in the past tense. How could it have been better for us during this pandemic? What could we have done differently? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, the unfortunate news for today is um, 
we anticipate fully that we're going to be here for a while. Uh, and if you pay attention to COVID in the community, um, I'm sure you're well aware that the circumstances are changing, but they're not changing for the better at the moment. We're seeing an escalation in the number of cases, an escalation in the percent positivity rate. Um, and some of that is not with any associated increased testing. It's really just sort of at the same level. So uh, I think we're very much in the woes of the pandemic. Um, but I do have some good news to share today. I'm excited to work together with Judge Jordan and I'll let him make a few introductory comments and then we can dive in. Well, I was hoping for peace in the Middle East and a cure for COVID by today. So I got one out of two. Uh, <laughs> I will say this, uh, COVID-19 is still there and COVID-21 is probably around the corner. Our lives legally professionally have changed forever. We will never be the same as before. Much like 9-11 and our airport experiences, it has changed us forever. And let me just say, I think there's been a lot of good that's come out of this. And let me turn the lights off and cover one eye when I do this, all right? So follow me on this. What it's made us do, it's forced us to do what we're doing right now which is the Zoom hearings. And there's various video formats, but Zoom appears to be the one that most people and witnesses are familiar with. And at first it was odd and people weren't wearing pants and all that. I think we've got past all that and uh, we're now using it. And I know talking and, you know, again, all these uh, attorneys that are here appear in front of me all the time, um, that it, it has saved your clients money it has saved you time and money because you can appear from home or vacation or at the office at these hearings. And as many of you know, we've done lots of trials, right, Ms. Torres? We finished a four-dayer recently. Um, I think all the evidence and everything worked out perfectly. Um, some of you were involved in my case with the uh, uh, Chinese witnesses on evidentiary hearings, you know, 13 hours difference, and we were able to do it. You're getting really good about getting evidence to the witnesses as well as to the clerk and the court, and it's going much smoother in that regard. And as you know, I always invite your clients to come to every hearing, either telephonically or by Zoom, because I really do believe if your clients are involved in the case, they see what's going on, it helps you in uh, directing them and what to do. It also, I think, is going to help resolve the cases. So that's a good thing. But I, the problem with Zoom is simply that, you know, there's no more face to face. And we're used to that. We like people in our courtrooms or in hearing rooms. Um, we have found that because you're not face to face, some attorneys, not you, but some attorneys are a little bit more, um, how can I say it, aggressive with the other side. And we kind of got to nip that in the bud. Uh, a lot of heated exchanges, uh, even in front of the court. So uh, that's just a, a fact of not being around each other all the time. Uh, so I think it's been positive in making us go this way because, as you know, uh, in the past you had to request a telephonic argument for more than 30 minutes. You had to get a court order right? Not anymore in business court. We default to telephone, Zoom if requested on everything we're doing. And so you don't need to come to the courthouse. I know we started one on Monday where the attorneys and the clients came and the witnesses are going to be by Zoom. Uh, and that's doable. Of course, we're all wearing, you know, protective gear and keeping six feet apart. And that's going to continue for a while. But these are all very workable, and I, I think it's going to help to practice the law as we go further. Excellent. So, so thank you, Judge Jordan. Um, a couple of topics that, that we were asked to cover, and I, and I treat this a little bit like an um, experience at a fast food restaurant. Um, I don't have great success at fast food restaurants, particularly drive throughs When I drive through, uh, I, I make my order and it's always a custom order. I'm sorry. I'm one of those people that takes a little bit of time in the line to try to get things the way I like them. And no matter how I want it, 
I end up getting it the way they want to make it, uh, which routinely are not the same things. Um, I want to tell you some things, but that may not necessarily be what you want or need to hear. And so would you just just take advantage of this opportunity to type out some questions in the chat so we make sure that we're being responsive to your needs. Uh, you can have it your way today, all right? Uh, we, we'll do our best to make sure that you, you, you get to hear the information that you're looking for and get answers to your questions. When, um, when Sam sent me an email, he just sent me a, a note and said, you know, we, he anticipated that the pandemic would be gone, we'd be doing this seminar in person, and, and we really would be doing a recap of the things that had changed during the course of the pandemic, but we know that's not reality. Um, the reality is that we've now been here for about seven months. Um, I can tell you my crystal ball isn't great, but I, I would be shocked if we're not right where we are six to eight months from now. Um, I think things are going to continue in this same vein. I think we're gonna to continue to have to be masked. We're gonna to continue to have to be socially distanced. We're gonna have um, lots of, the, it's Groundhog Day. Um, you, you're gonna wake up and it's gonna look an awful lot the same for us. Now, the good news is it's been incredibly effective. Uh, you've gotten more hearing time than you could have asked for uh, in any given time period because we've made it available. We haven't been able to do jury trials. And so there's been lots and lots of hearing time. But in the business court, in the complex court that Judge Jordan is sitting in, as he mentioned, many of his trials are bench trials. And so those have been able to go forward. And even the lengthier trials, those that might take four or five days, Judge Jordan's been able to shepherd those through pretty effectively during this time. And, and I think we've all recognized over the course of the last seven months that this remote technology works. It may not be first choice. It may not be our preference. I call that familiarity bias. Um, we're familiar with coming down to the courthouse. We're familiar with looking into the eyes of the judge and watching his or her hand movements and, and body language. But this is a pretty good alternative. And once we get past that feeling of, of a lack of familiarity and we start to practice and we start to do, the experience just, just get better. Um, it's really been a pleasure on our end as judges to watch you all hone your craft, for you to get better at doing things this way and to be able to, to see that and to be a part of that has been exciting. And, and I, I have no doubt that in the last seven months, we've, we've far surpassed where we would have been seven years from now with that technology had we been forced to do it just as it was rolling out over time and as we grew comfortable with it. So the, the shock value, the, the all in for this experience really in many respects, as Judge Jordan said, has been beneficial. And so we're, we're grateful that you all have adapted or worked to adapt and that we have the chance to walk this journey with you. I think um, I, I, I talk about it as Groundhog's Day only in the sense that uh, we're in phase two down here at the courthouse right now. We know in, in phase two, we can do some limited in-person proceedings. And uh, yet most of what we do continues to be remote or virtual. With this exception, when we crossed the 30-day mark here at the courthouse in phase two, we became eligible under the Supreme Court's orders to start some jury trial work. And I'm very pleased to tell you that on October the 23rd, we picked two juries. And on October the 26th, the following Monday, we started our first jury trial here in the courthouse. It was a felony criminal trial. Um, the defendant was convicted, if those things matter to you, uh, but convicted of a lesser offense. And the trial went just famously. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, our jurors said, told us, acted as though they were entirely comfortable in this context, other than having to wear a mask all day in order to hear the evidence. But they all said, commented and, and remarked to us how safe they felt in the courthouse and were reassured that they were indeed safe. We were successful at keeping everybody masked, at keeping everybody safely socially distanced, at providing lots of hand sanitizer, gloves where necessary, face shields if desired, 
um, all of the things that might be appropriate or necessary to ensure people's safety in that space. And the jurors were rightly impressed and, and really had a great experience. So we decided we'd do another one. And in fact, we tried three, three cases uh, that first week of October the 26th. We're on Wednesday. We've already tried another four cases this week. Um, the jury trial experience is going well and I'm really encouraged that if the community numbers can stay under control, if we don't have just this pervasiveness of the virus, um, that we do stand a chance to begin to move towards civil jury trials ultimately. And I know that's the question I would have been asked the most often since we started this process is when are we gonna start trials? When are we gonna start trials? Well, good news is it's a coming. Um, and I, I really do feel confident about that. We, we have got the experience down. The, the courtroom has been, the courtroom layout has been changed. So if you're a jury trial lawyer, uh, you, you should come down and watch some of these felony trials. It'll, it'll be an eye opener for you as to how the, the layout works for a jury trial experience. Um, we're, we're optimistic again, that we can move cases through pretty quickly. We have just a couple of spots in our courthouse large enough to be able to select juries. And that is really uh, that and the, the capacity of our jury assembly room are going to be the two biggest limiting factors for us in how many trials we can move through the system at any given time. We have two arraignment courtrooms on the fourth floor, and that's what we're primarily using for felony jury selection. We have the 23rd floor courtroom, which really doesn't lay out as well as you might think it would to get large groups in there, but we are going to be able to try capital cases in there. So with 12 person juries, we'll be able to seat juries in the gallery area and actually try a case up there. And then we have our jury assembly room and that's what we envision utilizing for ju civil jury trial selection. That we would bring jurors into the jury assembly room after all the criminal juries have left and use that room actually to select a jury for a civil case. We're still somewhat limited in the length of trials that we can accommodate. And that's limited primarily by our jury box size. We can only seat seven jurors actually in a jury box any longer. We've taken all those chairs that were on posts out of the jury box, we've positioned seven chairs safely socially distanced inside of the jury box in a felony sized courtroom. And those are the spaces that we have to try cases. If you've got a two week trial, we know you typically wanna have more than seven jurors, one another alternate or possibly two. And that starts where, where we start to stretch at the seams and have difficulty getting enough um, folks into the jury box to try a lengthy case. The trials have gone very smoothly. Uh, we utilize during jury selection, clear face masks so that you can see the jurors expressions on their face as they're responding to your questions. Not face shields, but face masks that actually fit tightly against their face so it's safe. We've been in consultation with our Department of Health locally on all of the issues associated with moving people in and out of the courthouse, jurors in and out jurors into courtrooms, jurors back into deliberation rooms, and feel very confident in the safety of the process. So very encouraged, and, and I, I think you should keep your ear to the ground because I think it's coming pretty quickly that we will figure out how to try enough of the felony cases to get that docket moving, how we'll get some of those county misdemeanor cases moving to trial, and then start to add on to that some uh, circuit civil trials uh, for us to be able to, to move the, these dockets as well. We know uh, dockets have backed up, uh, trust me. Um, I think we calculated we're about three years worth of trial days behind right now. Now that's everything, that's felony criminal, county criminal and circuit civil, but three years worth of trials that need to be caught up. We're making progress. Uh, at, at seven a week, um, that, that's, a, that's a pretty strong move. And um, we think we can, we can increase the numbers even greater than that and do it safely so that we can start moving the dockets. Judge Jordan, why don't you chat for a while? Yeah, so uh, Robin Kramer asked about uh, evidentiary hearings and uh, we have done a lot of them. The key is getting a complete set in an in a evidence notebook 
with the tags and we can email you the tag instructions or you can get them from the clerk. And to mark it identification alphabetical, please. And we'll, if it goes into evidence, we'll receive a number. We get the, the clean set that you'll send me and I'll hand to the clerk. So don't send the clerk in and give it to me. And then I like a bench copy because I like to write on the exhibits during the trial. So if that's possible, it'd be great. Listen, we know that things are gonna be supplemented and much like a, a regular hearing, something new is gonna come in. You email it, we'll print it, we'll do the tags and everything. We're accommodating you in that regard. But, uh, you know, early on when we didn't really, everybody kind of stopped and we didn't have any bench trials. We had tons of hearing time. Uh, if, if you need hearing time next week, we have tons of hearing time because Mr. Uh, Shipley's case didn't go to trial. So uh, feel free to, to do that, but you just have to watch Jack's for hearing time. You can always request the specific amount. I'll look at it. And of course, my J Kathy will also gatekeep on that as well. Our goal is to get as much hearings as we can, because again, I'm preaching to the choir. You hear me at case management. What do I say? File your motions early and often, because as a trial attorney, nothing worse than going to trial and telling the trial judge, uh, you never ruled on our summary judgment. And he says, okay, denied. I mean, that's not practicing law and I won't do that to you. So uh, you may not like my ruling, that's okay, but I'll rule on it. So that by the time uh, you get to mediation, you'll be in a position to make an educated decision on that and, and advise your clients. And again, please have your clients appear at all hearings or at least offer it. Uh, I want them to hear what's going on. You know, I always ask the clients at the case manager, do you have any questions for the court? Not about your case, but anything. I think that's important. I know when I was practicing law, um, my clients enjoyed being involved. They enjoyed going to the courtroom every now and then to watch a hearing. Well, now they can watch every hearing or listen to it. But again, you've got to request Zoom because we have to send out the invite so I can be the administrator. So don't wait till the day of hearing and say, oh, we wanna do Zoom. That's not gonna work. Do it ahead of time so that we can uh, do it. And, and it was not Mr. Shipley's fault, I'm being reminded. Uh, Mr. Uh, San Giovanni's mother unfortunately came down with COVID and we had to cancel. So, I mean, that's another effect of COVID. Uh, I would be remiss after that reference by our chief judge to not pull out Punxsutawney Phil. He's wearing proper gear. And uh, he says, uh, February 2nd, come by. As many of you know, I have an annual groundhog party and it'll be February 2nd between 10 and two. And I think we're gonna do it outdoors here at Juvie. So keep that in mind. And if he sees his shadow, it's another six weeks of only non-jury trials. But if he sees no shadow, we get to start some jury cases. Is that the way that works? Listen, I'm ready. Listen, look. Hey, look. See that? I'm here every day. I don't work from home. <laughs> you know, I am. Uh, I will do anything I can to get a jury trial. But right now, uh, apparently, people who have loss of liberty issues take precedence over civil. Don't know why, but they take presents, but we're gonna be back at it. And, and I think gonna be quicker than I thought the way, uh, what a good job Judge Myers is doing. Well, so you, you all may not have appreciated what Judge Jordan was holding up. That's his judicial ID. It gives him access to the courthouse here and you'll see a number of colored dots on there. Uh, just like members of the public and just like members of the bar, all judges go through the same health screening and temperature checks as those folks who are coming to the courthouse otherwise. All employees, um, all litigants, anybody coming to visit the clerk's office, we document that by placement of that colored sticker on an ID. And so we all handle it a little differently. I tend to stack my, uh, I hate these digital backgrounds. That's apparently not gonna work. If you can see the colored dots, we've all got the colored dots because it's an effort to ensure consistency and safety inside the courthouse. We take this so seriously. Um, I, I can't tell you for the uh, longest time. I, I mean, I really felt personally impacted when somebody inside the courthouse would come down with a case of COVID. 
what was reassuring to me in the end and continues to, to be reassuring is that to our knowledge, there have not been any cases of the virus passed inside the courthouse setting. Um, and, and that is important to us. We want to maintain a safe place for your clients to appear, for jurors to come in. Remember, jurors don't volunteer. They're compelled to come in. If we're going to bring them in by a subpoena or summons. We, we, we want to ensure that they've got a good and safe place to come into. One of the other questions that was asked is, is, uh, is speedy trial still on hold? And the answer is yes. Under the Supreme Court administrative order, so long as the circuit remains in phase two, and actually for a short time period in phase three, speedy trial remains told. And as a result, um, we don't have the time pressures of speedy trial weighing down on us as we try to get jury trials moving. Um, our, our felony division, if you do any criminal work, it's just fascinating, but they, they've identified their top 200 cases to get tried. They've worked their way through over half that list in the last two weeks because many of those cases just pled once they recognized the jury trial was a reality. Now there's another list of 200 right behind it. So we'll continue to, to uh, aggressively move those criminal cases forward. But notwithstanding what's happening in criminal, I do think that we have some capacity to bring jurors in for civil cases, but it's gonna depend on a couple of factors. And let me, I, I'll share these with you because I think it's good to begin to think in these terms. The things that slow jury duty down, what, what, what takes so long picking a jury? Well, one of the things are hardships. We know um, that if you've got a two week long case and you need a jury for it, you're gonna have some folks that are sitting on that panel that just are not gonna be able to, to serve. Two weeks is too long, they can't miss out on employment, they've got doctor's appointments or somebody they're taking care of. We, we know if we can address hardships up front and move them off the panel, now you're only speaking to jurors that could actually sit. That saves us a tremendous amount of time. So I've encouraged our civil judges to begin to think in terms of clearing out that those jurors that are not going to be able to sit and doing that early on in the process. So instead of asking your questions to a group of 35 or 40, you're really talking to the 25 folks that are likely to be able to sit on your jury. Another thing that is, is, helps us to move along quickly is if the lawyers will agree to use a paddle system with jurors. And if you've never done this, it's a pretty simple system. Every juror is given a paddle. It's a piece of paper on a stick and it's got their seat number on it, numbered one through 30 jurors, for example. And instead of referring to the jurors by name, we refer to them simply by their paddle number. And it avoids the lawyers looking down at their papers and saying, I am Mr. Let's see, you're in the third seat over, Mr. Jones. Thank you so much for your answer. Let's let's um, let me see what Mr. Uh, no, Mrs. Smith thinks about your answer. That back and forth takes an awful lot of time. And so uh, if the lawyers will agree to utilize a paddle system, nobody's ingratiating themselves with the jurors through their spot on memory of names or or uh, how quaintly they can pronounce those names. It, it, it really is focused on the process of getting a jury that's going to be fair on the issues that you all have to try. In addition to that, um, it takes a conscientious effort to do it, but if the parties will agree to limit the time, I really do believe we can get a group of jurors in, say, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and be able to work the rest of the day to get a jury with them right there in the jury assembly room. And then we can move your trial up into one of our larger courtrooms where we have ability for everybody to be safely socially distanced. So long, an long answer to the speedy trial issue, but, but I, I, I'm confident we can start getting some civil cases in this mix. Yeah, so you can see the chief judge is proactive on this uh, and uh, we expect to get to civil jury trials as soon as possible. As you know, I have gone and uh, got his favorite uh, brand of tea and asked, uh, I'll take any of the rejects from criminal to do a civil trial. He has not uh, kicked me out of his office, but we're going to do everything we can to do civil trials. And I fully expect that early next year, I'll be doing civil trials. 
So that's my goal. We're going to do what we can. But we're, we've been very busy with the non-jury trial, so that's working out great. Uh, so keep that in mind. We're going to do everything we can as far as that goes. Y'all are doing a great job. Uh, you know, obviously focus on if you got to cancel something, let us know as soon as possible so we can open up hearing time. Because uh, I really believe that hearing time is where cases get resolved and those logs known as lawsuits coming down the river will keep flowing if I can rule on your motions. But if they back up, it becomes a problem. And one more thing I just have to mention, something happened yesterday, a little election. Well, 20 years ago, you remember Bush v. Gore? Well, some of you do, some of you are too young. But right after that, I gave a seminar on uh, pre-suit mediation. I'm gonna show you the, the thing here. And it said, pre-suit mediation, settle in the primaries and avoid the electoral college. So like Groundhog Day, things have come back, haven't they? So uh, we're gonna do everything we can to keep it moving. Um, you know, the key to business court is to email Kathy, my JA, she can answer your questions because I don't set hearings. I don't have that power. She does. So, you know, clear it through her. If she says you got to go to the judge if you need more time, then set it during short matters. But if you did a, you know, this, the South Florida attorneys are, are big on this because down there it directly cues to the business court judges and they get it. We don't do that here. And so they'll do the notice of fully brief, but they don't send us a copy. So if you've got something that's fully briefed that hasn't been ruled on, contact Kathy to make sure that we've actually received it, okay, so that we can uh, put it in the queue. But we are uh, working very hard, as some of you will know, you've seen all our filings recently uh, of orders. Uh, so we want to do everything we can, you know, we want to be part of the solution. The whole idea of business court, you know, is to help facilitate, but not only that, to let the attorneys and the clients know that we've got a system set up to get a consistency of rulings. Um, so, you know, nationwide, you look at the business court, you know, they've, they have a business court college that started like 15 years ago. Uh, Georgia has a constitutional amendment for business courts. Uh, we'll probably have to go that route too, because I don't think they'll uh, adopt what the Florida bar suggested, which is the uh, uh, one for each district court of appeal, you'll have two judges. So a total of 10 new judges for each district court of appeal to do business court. But I think someday we'll be there. And I think that's good for everybody because look, this is not a slip and fall. Okay. Where the plaintiff has been reading billboards and watching TV commercials and they think their case is worth a million dollars. This is sophisticated clients who have been through the process who understand that it's going to cost, you know, a million dollars in attorney's fees and costs just through trial. And they know they have to make a business decision. And that's the beauty of business court so that we can case manage uh, and facilitate you through that process. So you can ultimately resolve it or we'll have a trial. It's whatever you want to do. So were there some more questions? Let me, um, while we're looking for more questions, I think there's one more in the chat there, Judge Jordan, if you want to take a look at that. But let me, I, this is, I, you are some of the very best of the best lawyers that we have in town. And, and we know that. We, we are so deeply grateful for that. And I, I see Richard Dellinger on the line with us. And Richard was such a tremendous partner for the Ninth Circuit when we were in Tallahassee lobbying to get some additional judges um, for the business court, and then thereafter um, to supplement our other resources. And, and I, I'm turning to you again. It's, it, we're not too early in the season. The legislature will be gathering again, uh, certainly in March, but we think it's possible they may even have a special session between now and March to address the state's budget and budgetary woes. If you follow the Ninth Circuit, you know uh, that last year the legislature passed a bill to add an additional two circuit judges and one county judge to the Ninth Judicial Circuit. They even put that money in the budget and passed that budget out of the legislature. And then COVID hit. 
And in response, the governor made a decision to line item veto the money for additional judges. So while we have a, a statutory entitlement to add three judges here in the Ninth Circuit, there isn't any money for that right now. And yet here we find ourselves in, an, in a, a very difficult economic circumstance attributable to the pandemic and the challenge that our state will face in revenues as a consequence of decreases in sales tax, decreases in uh, tourist taxes, all of those things that are a part of the revenue that we rely on both in the state and locally for the funding of portions of the court system. I will tell you my belief is that in order for business to come back, to come back and to be strong, the courts have to be positioned well to assist them to do that. In other words, if we're not able to do our job fully, we're gonna face challenges with moving forward as a state. I wanna encourage you to the extent that you have contacts in the legislature or contacts in the governor's office, please encourage them to not only fund the judges that are already a part of the statute now, but also to seriously consider an adequate response to the pandemic generated workload. What's that? Well, that's the fancy name for the backlog, the pandemic generated workload. We have about three or four categories of cases that are building. We have those cases that are set for trial that we can't try. That includes business court cases. It also includes business cases in our general circuit civil divisions. We have a group of cases that was not filed during the pandemic that's going to be filed. In fact, we're already seeing our filings return almost back to normal levels. If you file, if you read the uh, Florida Bar News, you saw we had record days of e-filing going on. So lawyers, have, they're catching up. They get it. If, if they're going to be productive, they've got to be filing. We have a group of cases that are pandemic generated. Uh, insurance types of claims associated with the pandemic, with the closure of businesses and other opportunities throughout the community. And then we have the backlog that is accumulated that we just can't get to because of the fact that every hearing takes longer, every um, hearing takes more people, everything that we do in the courthouse seems to take more space. It's just the pace of things have slowed down a little bit. So we've got all this work that's building up and, and I just, just would encourage you as our partners uh, with folks in Tallahassee to continue to encourage. Now, I, I would not wanna be a legislator right now these are some incredibly difficult choices that they have to make with limited resources, but business matters. And if we want business to return and return well, we need a court system that can adequately support it and do its job through the return as well. So I got a question about, you know, COVID, everything is shut down, nobody's gonna settle. And I will tell you as a former civil attorney, I did both uh, plaintiff and defense uh, I kind of raised that question across the, uh, the spectrum there. And initially everybody was hesitant because without a trial date, you know, sometimes it's hard to get people to resolve things. What I found out is, is once they got comfortable with the Zoom mediations, um, things started to resolve. I mean, insurance companies, think about it. They have to do what? Make a profit, right? In order to do that, they have to set reserves so they can invest the rest of the money. So they like to clear out cases, especially by the end of the year, hint, hint, hint. Um, so they're resolving things. They're comfortable with mediation and arbitration by Zoom. So things are moving. And again, if you've been around me at all, what do I always say about how to move cases? Those logs down the river make you touch the file. Because every time you touch the file, it's closer to getting resolved because I've take, took your focus off, off of everything else, made you pick up your file. And, you know, without Zoom, it was like, well, I don't wanna go to the courthouse for this. I'll just call the other side and resolve it. So that's kind of a downside for Zoom. You don't have that, you know, travel to Kissimmee or the Orange County Courthouse and go through security. But every time you touch the file, the case is getting closer to resolving. So, you know, in business court, we have a case management, we have deadlines. Uh, we have short matters, extended short matters, where we can resolve a lot of contested matters. 
between 8.30 and 9.30. So that's why I say file your motions early and often because you're touching your file. So it is working. I think everybody's over the, I don't have a firm jury trial date. I'm not going to do anything. That's my opinion to talk to people. You may disagree, but I'm ready to try cases. You know, the question was February, you know, 2021, am I going to have jury trials? I plan to, you know, I plan to start as soon as possible. So it's just a matter of getting the green light. No pressure, Chief Judge. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I, I get the chance to speak with mediators around town. I was just at lunch and ran into one, in fact, and, and he told me that mediations are just gangbusters right now. Um, I think Lawrence Collins on the, the call with us here today, and I think Lawrence would, would verify that the, the Zoom mediations are effective. You can accomplish so much and, and you need to take advantage of the opportunity. You, you can't uh, risk not getting cases resolved in timely fashion. And so it's why I think the business court model works so well because we know you can get decisions made on substantive legal issues on the things that make a difference to the outcome of a case. And so by the time you're close to getting ready for trial, you've got or should have really most of those issues locked down in some form. And, and I think that's an effective time and place to get involved in a mediation. I know there's always that worry as a mediator and, and as the parties, can you, um, it, it, are you going to be able to establish relationships sufficient to help move a party across the line when it comes to, to reaching a settlement in the Zoom context remotely? It's tough. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I can deny that it is a bigger challenge. Do two or three mediations. Consider bringing your client to the mediator's office and you all sitting with the mediator separately from the other party who appears by Zoom. Find ways to overcome those issues. You all are a creative lot. These are, these are the challenges that make our job fun, right? Is to try to figure out new ingenious ways to move cases, to get issues resolved and to try to reach resolution for the benefit of our clients. And in the meantime, we all know when we're working, we're getting paid. And I'll just tell you, that's, another, that's been another thing that's been heavy on me during this entire pandemic is to make sure that the court is creating opportunities for lawyers to conduct business. Because if you're conducting business, you're generating revenue, you're keeping not only your own families fed, but those are the people that depend upon you for their incomes as well. So we wanna be responsive and, and continue to make ourselves available for that. Absolutely. So two words I would leave you with, force majeure. I expect a 10 page memorandum of law because that's going to be a big issue in these COVID cases down the road, isn't it? Like everything was in there on the insurance policy or whatever, but you know, it's COVID was not necessarily covered. Sometimes it is because, you know, we had swine flu and a lot of the policies changed after that, but not all of them. So that's going to be a big issue going forward. So get some associate on that right away. <laughs> and listen, Judge Myers, apparently I've made you the bad guy here. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Because <laughs> they're saying, okay, so ask Judge Myers how likely it is that business court will be having jury trials in February 2021. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Again, my crystal ball is a little cloudy when it comes to that far out. What I do know is this. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have taken the time to read the Supreme Court administrative orders. They, they've kind of become well-worn uh, pages dog-eared, highlighted in different colors, handwritten on pieces of paper that sit on my desk constantly. And, and I have to focus for the benefit of the circuit on the, primarily on the benchmark criteria that allow us to go forward. And the one benchmark criteria that we don't have control of is, is the community conditions we have to look to two measures in our community. We have to look to the number of positive cases that have been diagnosed daily with a weekly average of that number. And, and we have to ask ourselves, have there been two consecutive weeks of increase? 
So was week number one, five, week number two, seven, and week number three, uh, most recent week nine. That, that would be two consecutive weeks of increase over that baseline. Only the numbers aren't five, seven, and nine. We started at about 145. We're looking at average daily numbers that are approaching 300 at this point. So the community is struggling with the virus. The second data element of that benchmark criteria is the percent positivity rate. We know that the epidemiologists look at 10% as a number that causes concern because that's evidence of community spread of the virus. And we've been seeing numbers, um, and I'll, I'll just start post uh, NBA bubble because I think those are the most real numbers we've seen in a while that were consistently in the four to 6% positivity rate. That number has now crept up. Today, we were over 8%. And it looks like it's going to continue to climb. When we get over 10%, we cannot conduct business in the courthouse any longer. No in-person hearings, with the exception of those things that are absolutely essential business. We still do Zoom. Okay. We still do Zoom, absolutely. You're just not gonna no. be able to get in the building. You're just, you're just not going to be, we're going to be back to phase one and you're going to be in your office for everything because we just can't bring bodies into the courthouse. Um, I, I hope that's not the direction we're headed, but that is something that we're keeping a very close eye on. So I would tell you this is a period of opportunity because you can accomplish so much during this time. You, there is potentially the threat of a jury trial hanging on the back end of this. We move back to phase one. All that goes away and we have to start the process over and move back in.